stands for Post Exposure Prophylaxis for HIV. It's been around for oh, about 15 years now and it's been evolving all of the time as we've been trying out new medications and refining the process. Um, its effectiveness rate has been shown to be around 87% at reducing the risk of HIV transmission and PEP is given to patients who have had a risk where they think they may have been exposed to HIV and we've assessed them and found them to be eligible for this treatment. We don't give it to everyone, it has to be for somebody that has had a high risk exposure. So we would consider that to be somebody who had been sexually assaulted perhaps, somebody who had receptive anal sex, they were the bottom when they had anal sex and the condom either broke or there was no condom used, ejaculation has occurred and they are worried that they may have come into contact with HIV. Um, we have an assessment tool that we use that identifies which people would be most eligible for, um, for PEP because we don't want to use it on everybody because it is quite a potent cocktail of medication. Um, it is um, very safe, it's been used for a number of years and these days it comprises of two drugs. So we give a drug called tenofovir and we give a drug called valtegravir. These both work as what we call entry inhibitors. So they put up a barrier and prevent HIV from being able to break through the cell membranes into the nucleus of the cell, so into the centre of the cell where HIV would normally replicate. If a virus cannot replicate, it dies. So it shuts the door and prevents transmission. Now it has to be a much more potent combination than something like PrEP, which is pre-exposure treatment, because we're already dealing with a situation where we think somebody potentially could have HIV and it could be trying to multiply and grow in their body. So at this point, this is sending medication in which basically acts to chase that virus down, stop it from being able to replicate and kill it. Okay, PEP is really beneficial because it helps to break the chain of infection. So if somebody thinks they might have come into contact with HIV, then taking PEP can prevent them from contracting HIV, actually provide them with some reassurance that their risk is being reduced. Um, it is used quite widely uh, across the UK. Um, at the moment, uh, HIV rates within East Sussex are higher than the national average. Um, this is probably due to our proximity to Brighton and to London. Um, so our rate is around about one in 10,000, which doesn't sound a lot, but when you look at the population level and the fact that somebody who has HIV, who doesn't know, may be having multiple partners, who then may be having multiple partners, it can rapidly spread. And we have seen this historically when we've done research and studies across the UK of just how rapidly HIV can spread amongst the community. So we're really keen um, that people who think they may have had an exposure do get in touch and the key thing is if somebody thinks they've had a risk for HIV they need to contact the sexual health clinic within 72 hours because that is the time window for us to think about starting PEP on somebody and it is most effective the sooner it is given. Now if we're able to get somebody onto PEP within 24 hours of sex occurring we're probably looking at somewhere in the region of 93-94% effectiveness rate and some studies have gone as high as 96. When we get towards the 72 hour, we're looking at about 87%. So it does slightly tail off, but it is a really effective and safe treatment, um, which I've personally you know, administered to hundreds of patients um, and there have been no serious issues with it. It's very safe, it's very effective, and as long as people have adhered to the, the regime of taking it, I have yet to have a patient who has subsequently tested HIV positive. So, PEP is, as I said, two drugs, um, tenofovir and raltegravir. Now, tenofovir is a once a day drug, and raltegravir is taken twice a day. 
Now, these drugs should be taken after food because on an empty stomach, they can cause an upset tummy, so it may cause nausea and potentially could give somebody some diarrhea. This is much less if people are actually eating before they take it. So I would say, take it in the morning after you've had something to eat. Um, it's entirely up to you whether you want to take your tenofovir in the morning or in the evening, but you need to take tenofovir and one tablet of raltegravir, let's say in the morning, and then one tablet of raltegravir at night. This is a 28 day long course. So it is a bit of a commitment. Uh, and the longer that somebody is able to manage to take their pet for, then the, the more protection they are gonna have against the virus. Now, if somebody isn't able to tolerate it and they have to stop taking it after a week because it's making them feel really unwell, okay, it's not ideal but it will still have reduced their risk by a bit. So every day that somebody manages to take it reduces their risk that little bit more. And if people uh, are having side effects, what they need to do is to get in touch and let us know because we can properly advise them on how where they can adjust their regime or if there are things that they can do that will actually help to ease those side effects. And side effects normally disappear after a few days. So it's usually those first few days that they get them. Uh, common side effects tend to be nausea, sometimes diarrhea, sometimes tiredness, some, sometimes problems sleeping. It can make people just feel a bit achy and run down because it's an antiviral drug. So it's really putting some strain onto the immune system and the body can just feel a little bit washed out and achy for a few days. But that normally settles down and people carry on taking it without any problems. And what we would do is we would monitor people throughout that process to make sure that they're managing to take it okay and that there aren't any problems. If people miss a tablet for one reason or another, it's not going to be the end of the world. However, if they stop taking it and they miss, let's say, two days, then there isn't going to be any benefit in restarting it. So we would just say, no, let's stop it at that point. Um, Around about eight weeks after the exposure is the point that we would then start to do some HIV testing because that's the end of the window period for testing. Uh, and as I say, for patients that have actually taken PEP, I've yet to have anyone who has tested HIV positive as a result. Um, it's extremely safe. We've been using it for many years um, and we monitor people very closely. So actually the benefit of taking it far outweighs any potential risks. Okay. So after somebody has completed their PET course, obviously we test them throughout that period. So when they initially come in, they have to have some blood tests done to make sure we've got what we call a baseline set. So we've got an idea of what's already going on in their body. Um, two weeks after they start taking their PET, we would encourage them to think about doing chlamydia gonorrhea tests because these bacterial infections that they could have picked up, particularly if they've not used a condom for sex, um, so we encourage them to test at that point. Uh, now HIV, uh, we, do, we don't test for, for eight weeks after the exposure, simply because um, while they're on PET, there's no point in testing, they're in the window period, we're not gonna get an accurate result. Um, and we also test at that eight week point for syphilis and we would also do some testing for hepatitis B and C. Um, so we follow people up for the 28 day period that they're taking the pet and we follow them up at that eight week point after, after they start taking it. So it's kind of like a two month long process in total. Uh, we contact people to remind them when they need to come in and attend. Uh, and it's all confidential, free service. So, you know, it's something I really would encourage people to think about if they are concerned. And we do follow national guidance from the British HIV Association and the British Association of Sexual Health to make sure that we are giving people the most effective methods possible of protecting themselves. So, PEP is available to anybody that has had a high risk sexual encounter. So, we would be thinking about people who may have had anal sex, where they're the bottom the receptive partner, um, because their risk of HIV transmission is much greater than if they are the top. Uh, this is because when people have anal sex, they can get tears, um, micro tears in the rectum, and then potentially that gives an entry point for the virus. 
Um, the other times we would think about it would be in a situation where somebody has been sexually assaulted because again we don't know anything about their assailants um, so we would definitely consider it in that situation. There are other times but those are probably the main criteria that we would look at and we have guidance that is given to us by the British HIV Association so that if somebody has got a query they can get in touch and we can actually say yes we need to do it or actually no your risk is very low. Uh, I, sometimes I get people asking about things like oral sex, oral sex is extremely low risk so that wouldn't be something we would need to put people on to pet for. Um, and vaginal sex, you know, we need to look at the circumstances around it. So, you know, the type of sex, was it particularly violent, was there any bleeding, things like that. Um, and then we would make a decision about that. The infection rate for East Sussex is slightly higher than the national average, around about 1 in 10,000. Um, so, you know, I would encourage people to think about regular screening um, because that's one way of actually giving yourself some protection because the earlier we pick up on an infection, the easier it is to treat. And these days, if somebody does contract HIV, it's not a death sentence any longer. It's a chronic condition, it's manageable and people live completely normal lives. Information about PEP is available on the East Sussex Healthcare website. It's available through our team who work our social media. So we're on Grindr, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, Tinder, I believe. There's all kinds of things. You can probably find us on most things these days. I think probably we'll even be on TikTok soon if we're not already. Um, you can access PrEP, sorry, PEP from sexual health clinics. Other places that can start it include A&E, and the sexual assault referral centres. So they sometimes start people off on the medication and then they refer to us for us to follow up. And it may be that we stop people from taking it at the five day point because they may not actually need to take it and their risk is very low. Um, but if that's the case, then what we do is we follow up on people who have been started in those places and we follow them up and maintain uh, their sexual health throughout that process. Thank you.